All right. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm happy to, to welcome Hao Chi Zhang from Northwestern today. Hao Chi is the Breed Junior Chair of uh, Design and Computer Science at Northwestern and, um, and is working on a lot of cool stuff around scaling, how we teach research processes, and uh, specifically values at scale uh, enabled by technology. So I'm really looking forward to the talk. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Welcome. Hi, people. Um, so th thanks, Walter, for the wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, so today I, I, I want to share with you how I worked. Um, really, the way I think about it is how I work to align my work with my values um, and my, my hopes for the world. Okay? But my goal for this talk is not so much that you walk away embracing my values, um, but that it inspires you to think a bit about your own values and how to realize them um, out there at scale. Okay? And um, I think that'd be really wonderful um, if we all did that. And um, with that, I want to share with you some thoughts on computational ecosystems um, and what I think they could do for advancing the kind of values we, we all care about. Okay. So as I've come to learn more about my work, uh, I've come to realize that the general challenge underlying all the problems that I'm interested in uh, comes down to this. How can we create scalable solutions to human problems and advance desired human values in the absence of a technology that can overcome real-world constraints? Okay? So as a technologist, as somebody who designs technologies, um, this is a really unfortunate question for me to be asking. Right? Um, yet, this is the question that kept coming up uh, in, in my research. Okay? So let me just give you an example of this. Um, not long after I started at Northwestern, um, I started mentoring undergraduate students in research uh, through this new program I started called Design, Technology, and Research, or DTR. Um, this photo is from spring 2017, uh, 2014, um, and I started with about seven students. Um, so in less than two years, uh, I was mentoring over 20 students um, on 14 independent research projects. Okay? And very quickly, what I learned is that faculty time, it doesn't scale. <laughs> okay, you could try to stretch it, um, Right? And, and try to extend it, but, but really, you know, there's a fixed amount of time that, that we all have, and um, only so much we could give in that time. Um, so then the challenge is this. Um, how can a single faculty mentor train 20 plus students, right? This, this is the problem we're trying to scale a solution to, um, to cultivate self-directed learners who are capable of doing independent research uh, and who are building new knowledge. Okay? So these are some of the human values that I'm trying to advance um, through this problem. But in the absence of a technology that scales uh, mentor time, right? So this is a real world constraint that I was getting at where we could try to stretch faculty time, but um, it's, it's going to be a constraint. Um, so this question turns out to be really hard um, because the best human solution we have, unfortunately, doesn't scale. Okay? And you, you guys are all familiar with the solution. It's called apprenticeship or one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Okay? Um, and it's a highly effective model for training people how to do complex tasks like, like how to do research, for example. Um, but unfortunately, as Alan Collins, who's kind of the godfather of uh, cognitive apprenticeship, or apprenticeship of the mind for things like cognitive skills, like doing research, um, he, he says that apprenticeship requires a very small teacher-to-learner ratio that's just not realistic in the large educational systems of modern economy. Okay. So already we're seeing this kind of constraint that's hitting us, um, where we could try to do this great model of apprenticeship, but um, we're going to be constrained at how many students we could train. Um, and unlike for some other problems, um, there's not really a best machine solution in sight, right? So we could think about having software provide helpful prompts um, and to guide students' thinking, um, but no AI technology is really going to replace the faculty mentor in the foreseeable future. And one of the ways to think about that is that to do that, you really need computational models um, for thinking about how to solve these complex ill structure problems that are common in design and in research. And furthermore, um, you need similar computational models for instruction. Right? for teaching students how to actually do this so that they could self-direct their own work, and it's not just you know, some computer solving it. Um, and this seems to leave us with very few options. Right? So on one hand, you could think about waiting for a technological silver bullet, um, but that could take quite some time, or maybe it'll never come. Um, you could also think about compromising in a whole variety of ways. Right? You could think about, okay, well, forget research training. Let's scale the lecture classroom. Let's do MOOCs, um, which is great, right? but you're scaling something else while you're doing that. Um, you could think about training a small set of elite students, which is what most of us do as faculty. Um, you could think about giving undergraduate students a position in your lab, but maybe they're just doing group work. So some simple things to do some transcription, do some coding, but not really directing their own projects. And uh, effectively what I'm saying here is that all these options are possible, but 
they're not scaling that set of values that um, I cared about scaling that I mentioned earlier um, uh, in my talk. So over the last five years, this general question about thinking about scaling of the values that we care about has led us to the design of what I call computational ecosystems. And what computational ecosystems are, are systems that interweave community processes, social structures, and intelligent systems that together unite people and machines to overcome these larger challenges. So as you can see from this figure, um, these computational ecosystems incorporate many different components. Um, and the goal here is not just to concern ourselves with the design of components, which we'll think about as well, um, but instead to think about the design of the entire system. Um, and this focus on the system's approach to design echoes the calls from people such as the two Gawande from the Harvard Medical School. Okay. So here I have a quote uh, from a tool who argues that in essence, having great components is not enough. So the tool says, uh, we've been obsessed in medicine with components, we want the best drugs, the best technologies, the best specialists, but we don't think too much about how it all comes together. Um, it's a terrible design strategy, actually. Uh, and the tool goes on to say that making systems work uh, is the great task of our generation of physicians and scientists. I would go further to say that making systems work, whether it's in healthcare, education, climate change, and making a pathway out of poverty, is the great task of our generation as a whole. Uh, we've also seen similar calls for systems level thinking in AI, in artificial intelligence. So here I have a quote from Eric Horvitz, um, who's the director of Microsoft Research, and he says, I'm pretty sure that the next leaps in AI will come from integrative systems uh, rather than wedges. So wedges being wedges of intelligence or, or, or components. We need, to build, uh, we need to focus on building a system where the whole is greater than the parts. Okay. So again, this kind of call for systems level thinking. Um, and in HCI, there's been similar calls for system level thinking, um, and one of, such, uh, one of such calls comes from George Furness, um, who's here at Michigan. Um, and I really like this paper called Future Design, My Fault, the Morass, um, which I encourage people to read if they haven't read it already. And in this paper, George argues that it's likely that our designs will be more successful um, if we become more mindful of this bigger picture. So not only of our individual applications that we're building, um, but of the mosaic of responsive adaptive systems in which the applications we're building are embedded with. Um, so I think it will be all really wise to heed George's words here, uh, but what I'm going to argue in this talk is that we need to not only be mindful um, of the larger system, and for a lot of the problems that I care about, um, we're going to have to design the entire system. So to do that, um, in order to design this entire system, um, I'm going to take a socio-technical approach to design, uh, but I'm also going to extend it uh, to account for some of the added complexity of thinking about designing the entire system as one. Well. Okay. So for instance, uh, while well, when we design socio-technical systems, we do typically consider uh, the context of the larger system, in practice, the solutions that are designed are often designed component by component um, or layer by layer. Okay. So let me give you some examples. So for example, we might think about supporting group collaboration and then start building technologies um, for collaboration within a group. Or we might design technologies for coordinating crowds and thinking about how crowd workers can work together to solve some problem. Um, whereas with the computational ecosystems approach, um, we're trying to understand how to bring in multiple structures um, of people and interactions that could come together to jointly solve the problem um, and to allow us to explore these potential synergies that can arise when these component interactions inform one another uh, to enable new kinds of solutions. So for example, we might have solutions that leverage crowds and groups, right? and really thinking about the synergies that can happen uh, when we have this broader, more systems view of problem solving. Um, as another example, you could consider this approach of designing layer by layer. So you might think about um, first having a community process of how we work, um, and then designing the social structures that work well for that process, and then you go about designing tools to support those processes and social structures that are already in place. Um, and this is a really thoughtful approach to designing technologies, especially when, can, when you cannot change the existing processes or social structures that are there. Um, but what I'm arguing for is if you could, and you had the opportunity to design entire vertical slices as one, um, then we might find new compositions of processes, social structures, and technologies that best work well together where in that composite, um, we're able to have very different designs um, than if you had assumed certain things to be fixed. So it's just uh, for us to think about not only the components, but all these different ways of um, connecting all our uh, 
ways of solving a problem, right? So not only looking at the technology, but maybe looking at vertical slices, not only looking at individual components, but looking across components as well. So with computational ecosystems, what I'm saying is that we're interested in designing simultaneously all these components um, of a socio-technical system as a single integrative solution. So we're still going to be thinking about people and technology, um, but we're going to be taking a more comprehensive approach, constructing both the parts and how these parts interact, um, both technically and, and also people -wise. And to do this, um, and to reason about all this added complexity, um, we're going to adopt two helpful perspectives when we're designing computational ecosystems. Um, so the first of which many of you will be familiar with is computational thinking, um, but where I'm using that term to mean decomposing and distributing problem solving to the diverse peoples and machines across an entire ecosystem. Right? So I'm not only thinking about cases of um, solving a problem and using an algorithm, or even doing something mixed initiative with one human and one machine, um, but instead I'm thinking about across all these interactions within an ecosystem, um, how might I leverage computational thinking broadly to solve a problem? Um, and further, um, there's this idea that we're going to refer back to called ecological thinking, where the idea is that we need to create sustainable processes and interactions that support both ecosystem members as individuals, um, but also the proper functioning of the ecosystem as a whole. Okay, so as I go through my talk, we're going to be leveraging these two ways of thinking um, onto the examples that, that we'll look at. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to look at, uh, I'm going to present two examples um, of computational ecosystems that we've been studying, uh, one for community-based planning and another one for scaling research training. Um, I'll then preview what's next in computational ecosystems, um, and then finally I'll end just with some thoughts on how computing technologies um, can be used to support and advance uh, human values at scale. So I just want to pause for a second. Um, any questions thus far? So we're on the same page before I move forward. I count in my head. <laughs> so what number? Ten. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what exactly is the difference between a group and a crowd? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry for not making that distinction too clear there, but often, you know, we think about studying as some scale, right, of a number of people collaborating, right, so, um, you know, you can see examples of, you know, groupware systems that think about, you know, tens or dozens of people, right, but it might be characterized by having closer relationships or being able to communicate in certain ways, uh, whereas with crowds, maybe it's different, maybe these people are not communicating as much across, but there's some way of coordinating problem solving, even though they're briefly involved. Right, so there's all these characterizations that we use when we study problems. And, and mostly my comment is that I think that's really useful you know, as scientists to understand how these pieces work. But as we gain that understanding, how might we leverage across that understanding to, to solve some of these more complicated problems we might be interested in? That's a great question. Any other questions so far? Okay, I just hit 10, so okay, next slide. Okay, so as my first example, um, I'd like to talk about community-based planning um, where we're gonna be designing um, for the value of having an inclusive process for planning community events that scales and that advances the goals of its members. Okay, so that's the value that I care about, so I'll repeat that. Um, so we want an inclusive process for planning community events that scales and that advances the goals of its members. <coughs> Um, so as a specific use case of this, um, we looked at how to plan large academic conferences. Okay, so um, what I'm showing you here is uh, a photo from, from CHI uh, 2012. And uh, what you see is a handful of associate chairs, uh, or ACs, it's about a dozen people in that room, um, planning the schedule for CHI, uh, where they're spending two days in person uh, to construct this preliminary schedule uh, with, with about 200 sessions. Um, by hand. Okay. And I think it's pretty clear that immediately that you see that there's some challenges that the organizers face in doing this. Um, and one of those challenges is that they really lack information about the diverse preferences, constraints, and knowledge that's held by the community members. So Kai's grown to have about 3,000, probably a little more now, uh, probably 3,500 uh, people who attend Kai every year. There's 500 accepted papers, 200 sessions that get scheduled with papers and all this other stuff that happens at Kai. Um, and it's just, there's no single person who knows about even all the content and all the themes that are at Kai. 
Um, and you know, even with a handful of people in the room, the, the, the schedules they put together is really dependent on the knowledge they have, but um, it often misses what, what other people want, um, and also uh, certain group groupings that, that really only other people need. Um, and the, the second thing, as you can see, is that the, the, the chairs really lack tools for managing the complexity of the schedule. So people are trying to resolve complex by hand here, um, but after these two days, the chairs actually take this paper schedule, they enter it into a computer, um, and then now they try to resolve all these conflicts that come up, because some person might be scheduled at two places at once. You could um, have talks that might be interesting to many people in two concurrent sessions. If people could only go to one, they, they won't be able to make the other. And then the chairs go through this process where they try to resolve a conflict by moving a session, for example. Um, and then as they move it and swap something else in another place, they create another conflict. Right? So it's like a, they describe it as a terrible game of whack-a-mole, right? It's like conflict, and then another one pops up. And you might be wondering, well, why don't they just run some optimizer and just solve it and squash all the conflicts? And one of the things is that when you're planning, there's a lot of tacit knowledge and other things that the organizers want to keep track of that's not really easy to encode in the system, right? So this is why they went through the pains of doing it through this manual process instead of just solving it. Um, but of course, this manual process has a lot of issues as well. They, they, they miss a whole bunch of stuff, um, and it takes the chairs about 100 hours um, to get the schedule to a point where they give up um, and just say, that's the best I can do. Right? And that schedule still has tons of problems. Um, so to overcome these challenges, uh, we created COBE, which is a computational ecosystem for a new process that we call community-informed planning. Um, so COPE is built on two simple ideas. Um, the first one is engage the entire community in the planning process. And the second one is give organizers the tools to manage the complexity of planning and to resolve conflicts. So this is pretty straightforward, um, but the question really is how, right? So how do you do this? Um, and I think thinking about this as a computational ecosystem is going to give us some interesting ideas. Um, so to start, to engage the entire community in planning, we created these new processes and tools for uh, having committee members uh, make sessions right after the PC meeting, right? So they make the initial sessions. We have authors tell us what papers they think fit in a session with their own paper. Um, so if you guys have papers at Kai, you might have got an author sourcing email recently. I can't believe they're still using it, but they are. Um, right, so they ask authors what papers fit in a session with their own, and they also ask authors what talks they want to see to make sure that we don't schedule those talks at the same time, um, but in a different session as, as the author's own talk. Um, we then help attendees navigate the schedule using a tool called Comfort, um, where the attendees are being recommended papers and sessions they might want to go to, and then we use the ones they favorite, the ones they want to go to, um, to predict way ahead of time what are going to be the popular sessions, so we can schedule them in bigger rooms, um, but we also find things that are of mutual interest, right? So two sessions that a lot of people are interested in but were scheduled at the same time, we try to move them to different times using that. Um, so this is all very reasonable, and everything I said so far, you know, is, is basically crowdsourcing, user-centered design, right, some code design. Um, but, but in addition to that, there are some computational challenges that, that come up. Okay? And one of the challenges, as an example, is that when you're making sessions, um, you have to account for what we call global constraints. Okay? So one way to think about this is you, you know, find a grouping that uh, this paper could fit into, and it looks like a good grouping, right? and you might create many such possible groupings. But once you put a paper in a particular session and you say, this is the grouping I want this paper to be in, all the other groupings that contain that paper effectively aren't useful anymore, right? Because those sessions can't be made um, because, you know, that paper is already here. Um, so these kind of constraints make it difficult for us to think about um, how do we actually support collaboration where people are going to be working on this problem together, right? We can't just have people grabbing, you know, like literally physically grabbing a paper and saying, my pile, right? What someone else is thinking might go in another pile. So to resolve this challenge, um, a core idea that we have, and the first computational ecosystems kind of idea, um, is this two-phase collaborative planning process that involves both a large crowd of all the ACs, so about 200 people, um, but also a smaller group of about 10 ACs. Okay. So in phase one, um, we have all the ACs, um, and we ask them to uh, give us tags on papers, effectively. Right? So we elicit this metadata um, that describes the possible groupings of papers for sessions. And then in phase two, we have a smaller group of ACs that given all these flexible options, um, they can deliberate, they could discuss um, to better satisfy these tighter constraints right, that are really hard to satisfy um, when working with a large crowd. And then to facilitate these processes and have this real-time uh, collaborative planning process, um, we developed a system called Frenzy um, that uses what we call actionable feedback, which guide contributions by just letting people know what still needs work. So in phase one, it might tell people 
um, hey, there's still all these papers that don't have a lot of tags or aren't grouped a lot. But in phase two, it might talk about, well, there's these papers that are orphaned, that are not yet in a session, right? So you don't have these perfect sessions yet in, in these areas. So it just focuses uh, the people's attention on the part of the problem that needs work. Uh, but the interesting idea here is that just by changing the actionable feedback across the two phases of problem solving, what Frenzy effectively is, is that it starts as what we call a crowdware system, supporting a lot of people working together, not with a lot of deliberation, um, but later becomes a groupware system. Right? where you do have um, you know, a small group of people using the system um, supporting deliberation and things like that. Right? Which is an interesting idea of how you can leverage crowds and groups uh, in the same system just by changing the way this feedback is, is presented. Um, so coming back to this general challenge of engaging the community, um, for authors and attendees, we need ways to provide relevant suggestions if the systems are going to be of any use for them right? and for what they care about. Um, so we could treat these as isolated problems and think about um, using a machine-based approach, right? So we might do some TFIDF for author sourcing to find relevant papers. Um, for attendee sourcing, we could do collaborative filtering, right? And suggest um, people uh, the stuff that they might be interested in. Um, so what I'm going to argue now is that that's great. You could do that. Um, but we could do better uh, with a computational ecosystems kind of approach. Um, so the second core idea I'm presenting is something we call incentive chaining. And the core idea is we're trying to engage increasing sets of ecosystem members by using the data that's collected from an earlier interaction, feeding it to make the next interaction go better and get more data from the next interaction, and then so on and so forth down the chain. Okay. So for example, um, we have these expert categories that people generated in Frenzy. These are our associate chairs and program committee members. Um, we couple that with TFIDF to produce a list of similar papers for authors. Um, and these papers that we get um, instead of having someone you know, scan through hundreds of papers, the suggestions are very good um, and much better than if you just use TFIDF by itself. Because right? essentially you have these expert categories and groupings that are using in conjunction with the algorithm. And then using that, um, we provide that data as the seeds into our recommendation engine. Right? So by the time we get down to using Confer to recommend sessions and papers to attendees, um, those recommendations are really good right off the bat, um, effectively because we solved the CoStar problem. Right? Because normally for collaborative filtering, you have to like a bunch of stuff before it could give you really good recommendations. Um, but you don't have to here because the data that's coming through, we got about 10,000 data points from author sourcing. Um, the data is really good. Right? Because the authors invested some effort in, in finding papers that really are good fits with their paper. And actually, the data is double filtered, right? Because you also, that data also went through uh, the program committee as well. OK, so on to step two, um, helping these organizers resolve conflict. So we got all this data. We got about 20,000 data points. Um, we could just now all feed it into a computer and then hit the optimize button, right? <laughs> Someone's <laughs> nodding their head. Very brave. Appreciate it. OK, well, no, I think it's actually a terrible idea. <laughs> OK, um, but let's talk through it, and let's, let's try to unpack it. So I'll just present two reasons why I think it's uh, not a great idea, sorry, now I feel terrible <laughs> for, pointing, for pointing you out, I think. I was, I was being earnest, I thought that you could some solid people. Okay, but, but let's, <laughs> see, now I don't know if you're just playing with me. <laughs> yes. And then your professors are like, wait a second, did we admit the right person? Okay, sorry. I got a little iron here. Only iron? That's cool, well, there could be a little sarcasm. <laughs> oh, there might be a little sarcasm, okay. <laughs> great, so let's move on. Um, okay, so one of the reasons I'll present is that um, I think the problem is, is actually still highly underspecified. Right? So if you think about it from an optimization perspective, um, even as you get 10 or 20,000 data points, if you just think about pairwise relationships between papers, with 500 papers, that's 500 squared, right? That's already 250K, I think, right? And there's, of course, more relationships than that. So um, the thinking is, if you give this to an optimizer, it'll, it'll optimize it perfectly based on what it knows. Um, but it'll miss a lot of things. And the problem with missing a lot of things, right, one thing you might think is, well, let it do it, and then have the human fix it. Um, but in fact, the chairs don't have all the knowledge to fix it, right? Because what makes a good session, that information was distributed to start with. So to even go through the 200 sessions, which is to look at each session carefully to see if it's a good session, that's challenging. And, and for the chairs to be able to do it, they would have to have this knowledge that they don't possess. Okay. So that's one of the challenges. Go ahead. So, um 
I have, I have a question going back a little bit to your comment about the like crappy Kai schedule that may have been produced in the past and probably generally is produced every year. Uh -huh. Crappy by some individual metric by the things yeah. that they don't know that yeah. Yeah. I know or whatever that someone else knows. Um, so is the crappy schedule that's produced by the ACs who don't know those things that we know substantially worse than the crappy schedule that's produced by the computer that doesn't know the things that the AC knows? That's a great question. Um, I will say it's enough. I, I don't know the empirical answer to that question. I will say that it's enough of a concern that Kai painstakingly, before you know, doing this, was always using the human process, right? Because I think the, the, the worry was always that, um, yeah, you could put a bunch of stuff together, but what are the themes that are emerging? What are we trying to learn about? You know, who, what communities are we targeting? All that richness of how we think about humans and our experience of learning about uh, how to build knowledge, right? That gets lost. Um, so I think there's a values <coughs> argument there, right? So to make the argument about is it better or worse, it depends on what we value. And I think Kai, uh, unlike perhaps some conferences, let's say in AI or machine learning, maybe for obvious reasons, have yeah. come down on the different sides of that, right? So, so uh, uh, maybe I guess this, it's, it's crappy in ways that align with our values. <laughs> or, I mean, the inverse is the, the it's it's good, hopefully, in ways that sure. align with the values. Right? It, Although, it falls, at, it, it, you know, it falls short in some ways that are. But, but, you know, but what is painful in reality is that you still get you know two social computing sessions right next to each other on the schedule. Yeah. You still get all these issues that pop up. So, so I mean, I think that's really the challenge, right? Like, let's say we have a set of values we care about. When we go for scale, right, it, it does break down, right? Maybe we have the right idea. And we're trying to do the right thing, but we can't. Right, or we just have an idea, and then we don't do the right thing anyway. Right? And you're going to give us a solution that's better than either of those options anyway. Right? I, I, I will argue that pretty soon. Yeah, I'll okay. show you some of the data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's an interesting question. Right? I mean, I think that's how we tend to approach problems. That let's do it either like, oh, let's just do the thing we can do, or let's do it the right way, but then it doesn't really scale. Right? And what I'm really arguing for is to think about, well, what would be better than both of those? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really the goal. Okay, um, and the other thing I'll just mention quickly is that, uh, which I mentioned before, is chairs have these other things they care about. Right? A lot of that's not easy to encode uh, into the system. Uh, so then the third core idea I want to show you is this idea of having a community-based uh, or community-informed makes initiative interface. And what this interface does is it puts organizers in the driver's seat and it gives them a holistic view of all the constraints and preferences, both that the system knows um, and that comes from community input. Okay. So let me show you how this works. Um, so an organizer can now go in here and they have all these view options which give them this multi-dimensional view of the schedule where they can look at different things they care about and there's these personas, something that Kai was very into uh, a number of years ago. Um, so here you see that these red marks show the conflicts that are in the schedule. So this one has a lot of conflicts, they're proposing a move and the system highlights in green the sessions that it recommends um, that resolves the most conflicts if you make that swap that the system knows about. Right? So it doesn't mean that the green sessions are the ones that the chairs will necessarily choose, but it gives you this set of options. Essentially, the system is saying, here, here, here's what I know. Now do what you know on top of that. Right? So the chairs are still left in control, so they could apply their tacit knowledge, but they're also guided by the community input uh, that's now encoding the system and, and all these hard constraints, like don't put the same person in two places at once. Um, and what's really interesting to me about this process is that it allows the organizers to work on the schedule with confidence, um, where what you see on this red line is the number of conflicts going down over time as they're working on it, right? and that's not surprising. right? As you work, use any kind of optimization system, you're going to crush more conflicts over time. Right? What's really interesting to me is that even in the parts where the conflicts, the red line is not going down, um, the organizers are actually still making a bunch of changes to that schedule and improving the schedule. Right? And what's interesting about that is that they're able to improve the schedule uh, based on their tacit knowledge and the things that's not encoded in the system, but in a way that doesn't screw other things up. Right? Because now they see what the effect their, of their changes would be uh, per the things that the community members care about and per the hard constraints that are in the system. Right? So you have this way to apply the person's tacit knowledge, but also in incorporating um, the, the community, what the community cares about and, and these hard constraints. Um, so let me just show you some of the high-level outcomes from deploying this ecosystem. Um, so we deployed Kobe at uh, Kai 2012 and uh, Kai 2013 and also at CSCW in those same years. Um, and we have this inclusive process in Kai 2013 that engaged 1,500 community members in planning okay, across all these different phases. 
Um, we reduced organizers' planning time from 100 hours down to 5 hours. Um, and they were able to resolve uh, hundreds of previously hidden conflicts and produce better schedules. Okay. And this measure of uh, conflicts just comes from, in the system, right, we could see all these problems that before they would have dealt with, um, but now through that process of using the, the interface, they've had true reasons. Okay. And anecdotally, it seems like uh, during the years it was running, uh, people were really happy with the schedules. And then the second they stopped running it, people were less happy uh, mm -hmm. with the schedules. Right? And then when I say stop running it, um, I mean they stopped running the whole ecosystem. Okay? So for a while they were still using the scheduling tool, um, but they weren't doing author sourcing. Or they weren't doing attendee sourcing. They weren't getting these other sources of data all integrated. Um, and what you saw is that you know, it worked as an optimizer, but it didn't really encode the values the communities cared about. Right? So that without the system as a whole, you still don't quite get the benefits of realizing and scaling the values you actually cared about, um, which, as I've stated, is, is really having this inclusive process that includes the goals of, of all its members in the planning. Tachi, why, yep. why did they stop using? Uh, uh, I'll do the short version for now. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of software upkeep, right? So, you know, as a research project, you know, the, the way we joke about it, which unfortunately is true, is uh, we've moved on. So everyone who worked on the project became faculty. We all got cushy jobs. Not that cushy, but, but we all got jobs, and, and we moved on. We worked on other projects. Um, so Kai, they, they are actually, right? They brought back author sourcing this year without our help. Um, so, so there is some interest in getting that to continue running. Um, but having the software, but also being able to pass down that knowledge, right, of how do you do it? How do you get everything to integrate? Um, these are all challenges that come up when you're trying to pass down the whole system. Great, great question. And it pains me a little bit because when they don't use it, it it's not as good. It's, it's really bad sometimes. Okay, um, so just to recap, um, we have a computational ecosystem for community informed planning um, where I'm just introducing you to, to some of these ideas of thinking about uh, designing systems, right, going across and also going vertically in these slices. So we have uh, a way to do collaborative planning that it's across crowds and groups, right? We have a way to chain contributions across the ecosystem where Someone provides some data through interaction. That data is used to, to enhance another interaction, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we have these mixed initiative interfaces that empower organizers to make these informed decisions by really bringing together all the community's input, what the system could do, um, and all the tasks and knowledge of the organizers as well. And just, just some uh, ideas for, for how we could solve these larger problems where a single component would have quite done it, um, but with a system we can. Uh, any questions thus far in this part of the talk? Yes? What do we do with the obvious um, author can't present that day issue? Like author can't, can't present that day. Does happen actually? Like that the author actually now says, okay, I'll oh. sign the Wednesday. Yeah, that happens, which, right? So at which stage in the process would this happen? So you could collect that information from author sourcing, and I think that's what we were doing, um, but we didn't have a like form input for we just had a, a text box for that, like if there's any extenuating circumstances. Okay, and there's a, there's a and there's a language we have backend that allows us to encode constraints like that, right? So you, you have this kind of flexible language, but some of the things, you know, you could also try to just handle manually, right? Um, if it's easy and it's not too many of them. The problem is if everyone starts sending you those things, right? Do you, do you really want to address it? How do you weigh different preferences among different people? It could get messier, right? So there's always still a human in the loop that is making some kind of decision on weighing these values. But, but yeah, you could encode that kind of conflict in the system. Any other questions? Yeah. So, um, so I guess from your description, on, on the one side you have this very tightly integrated, complex ecosystem of things that all work together, yep. and so you're optimizing for the system as a whole. Yep. And I guess the, the other extreme version of that is sort of like a house of cards, where everything depends upon everything yep. else, so as soon as you lose a component, now you're almost back to where you start. Great, great question. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I would say, Paul, this morning when we talked, you asked kind of a version of this question too, or a comment, which was, you know, you do want to make sure that each of the components is useful on their own, mm -hmm. right? That you might get some benefits synergistically as you use uh, multiple components together. Um, and that's definitely the case here, right? So, you know, even when they just have the, organize, uh, the optimizer, it saves the organizers a lot of time, and they're still doing better than they were doing before, right? But if you don't encode the community values, you, you still lose something. Right? The, the argument I'm really making is that to really realize this set of values, you need the whole system. But not that uh, without, uh, or with just having certain components, um, you don't have an improvement for the users immediately. Right? You still want that to be true. Um, and, and it's a good question and something that we, we do need to be aware of, um, that some of these dependencies, you know, if they break and everything falls apart, um, we, we want to be, be, be careful of that. That happens. It's a great question.
Okay, I'll take one more. Uh, I'll do a over here. Yeah. Um, does the computational ecosystem make that tacit knowledge, uh, knowledge that the organizers are more obvious to the community? So that over the course of a certain number of years, you can have a, uh, an alignment sure. of the two. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll, 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 without mentioning names, um, I, will, I will say that uh, one organizer uh, had asked us, uh, can we make sure that anything we encode in the system uh, do, not, do not appear in the system to other people? Right? So there's some interesting questions there about values and privacy and, and what values people want to, because you know, organizers have to make tough trade-offs. There's always trade-offs they have to make. And, um, how much of that they want to be explicit, how much of that is things that should be discussed. I, I think you know, there's really important questions about how that community wants to deal with that. It's, it's pretty external to this system right now. Um, but it's, it's really a astute observation on your part, right? It's like, well, maybe we could get better alignment of values. Yeah, I, I think that's right over time. Um, but we need to, to have a form for doing that and a way of doing that that you know, it's almost external to this. OK, I'm going to move on just, just to. Uh, talk about the next part of my talk, um, so we have discussions here, um, where I'm going to talk about scaling research training, and in particular, this idea um, of cultivating uh, self-directed learners. So the, the main point I want to make on this slide is that what we found is that if you want students to become self-directed so that they could do independent research, um, they're going to need regulation skills. Okay? And the term regulation skills comes from psychology at first, and then later in the learning sciences, and the core idea is just that if there's some goal you want to reach, some complex thing you want to do, uh, what are all the cognitive, metacognitive, motivational, and emotional skills you would need uh, to reach that goal? Um, and independent research requires regulation skills, for example, to plan your research work, um, but also to seek help to overcome challenges um, that, that will come up. Um, and what happens is that if students lack these skills, they're often confined to root tasks, right? So someone could give them something to do, and they could just do it. Um, but they can't self-direct, and they could also struggle to make progress um, once they hit a blocker because they don't have that direction or, or way to think about what, what, I, what I should do next. Okay. Um, and what I'm not saying on the slide, um, but I'll mention, is that regulation skills are um, really hard to learn, and I, I think that's something that um, we would all agree with. Um, but the other thing, um, you know, no, no, no major offense uh, to the faculty, is that um, as professors, we, we normally do a terrible job of teaching regulation skills. Uh, to students, um, that we don't necessarily prioritize them, and, and um, often what can happen is that students could bang their head, and research feels like this process that you just keep doing it until you figure it out. Okay? And the argument I'm making is that there's got to be a better way um, to helping students uh, develop more effective processes to be independent in research, and that that starts uh, with training students uh, explicitly in, in regulation skills. Um, so to address this challenge, um, we created a computational ecosystem that we call Agile Research Studios, and it provides a model for research training in a learning community. Um, in this model, all the students, regardless of seniority, uh, conduct independent research and receive authentic research practice. And by authentic research practice, what I mean is that all the students go through a self-directed project cycle uh, where they set their goals, they learn what it is they need to learn to meet those goals, they plan their work, they make progress, they reflect on what's been done and learned, and then they continue this process over again. So one of the core ideas behind the Agile research model then uh, is that it scales faculty time. So we've already talked a bit about where the apprenticeship model um, doesn't really scale very well for faculty time. Um, but you might be imagining, well, why can't we do a hierarchical model, right? So you have the faculty members at the top. Um, they mentor the graduate students, and then the graduate students mentor the undergrads. Uh, the challenge, though, is that as, under, uh, as graduate students are learning how to do research, um, that doesn't necessarily make them effective mentors. Right? So this is a nice learning science result from Shulman, uh, which effectively says that being good at doing something doesn't mean you're a good teacher of that thing. And what ends up happening is that um, the undergrads working under the graduate students um, could still end up doing root tasks. Right? And that's what happens uh, a lot of the time. So what we're going to argue for uh, in the ARS approach is that this first control model where in order to overcome what's known as the 1x challenge, so one faculty uh, with many students, effectively what we need to do is to disperse the control of the mentoring not only from the faculty's perspective, but across the network of students that are within this community. Right? That, that, this is really the only way, uh, conceptually, that we're going to scale. And then the question is, what, what, what do those edges look like, and what are those interactions and groupings um, that we come up with? 
Um, so I'm going to show you uh, ARS as a computational ecosystem with all these processes, social structures, and tools that work together to help students develop regulations. Okay. So ARS adapts agile processes um, from software development and from design, um, but for the purpose of scaffolding self-directed research training. Um, we have mentoring that's going to be distributed across social structures to support students learning how to plan research work, um, but also getting help within a supportive community. And then we have all these virtual studio tools that's going to support learning through this agile process and promote effective interactions uh, within the community as a whole. So I'm not going to have time to show you the entire system um, or the entire model, um, but I'll give you a couple of vertical slices just to build intuition. So the first vertical slice I want to show uh, is thinking about how we use ARS to support students learning how to plan research work. So uh, we adapt, as I was saying, we adapt the agile process from software development and design, and what our students do is that they plan their work at two-week intervals, um, but not to deliver user value, um, but instead to deliver research value. Okay? And that's something I'm happy to talk about uh, more in detail offline, but at a high level, you can think about it as if research is this process of, of um, investigating something, um, there's some knowledge you're trying to build, um, you could try to represent the current state of knowledge on a canvas, and there's these knowledges that uh, students don't have yet, so you can think about what's the riskiest risk to answering your question, um, and then the sprints are effectively chewing off the parts of that canvas where you have the riskiest risk, so that you advance your knowledge the most in the two weeks that you have. Okay? And then how we do that practically is something I'm happy to talk about uh, in much more detail. Um, so to support students learning how to script plan, um, we have SIG meetings. So SIG meetings are these special interest group meetings where multiple project teams, normally two or three, come together uh, with both a faculty mentor and a SIG head who's a PhD student who's being trained to lead their own SIG. Okay. So the way to think about it from the PhD student's perspective is that um, my PhD students, by the time they graduate, would have advised probably a minimum of five to eight projects and 10 to 50 students. Um, so the PhD students are being trained to effectively run their own research lab. Okay. And by the time they're done with this program, they've already uh, essentially ran a mini research lab. Um, and then within this meeting, what's happening is that we're teaching students how to script plan. And in particular, we're helping students develop these regulation skills uh, in the form of effective planning strategies. Right? So students might come in saying, here's my plan, here's what I'm trying to do. And then we would ask them to think about, well, what are some alternative options? Like, why did you do this instead of that? Um, okay, well, this seems like it would take a lot of points or a lot of hours to get this done. Is there a slice of this that you could do that would help you answer the same question, but with, with less time? Okay. And so on and so forth. Um, and then to support students recording uh, their work and their sprints and their plans um, and getting feedback from others, we have a sprint log, which is a lot like any project tracking tool that you might have seen, um, with the caveat that we added these additional questions um, to help uh, scaffold students thinking about regulation. So we have questions like, what do you think might be blockers you might hit as you're doing this? What are the deliverables going to look like exactly? And these questions effectively you could think about as, as questions from learners that are often missing from the professional tools, um, but really important for building these regulation skills. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention just real quickly, uh, we limit our students to eight points a week, which roughly you could think about as eight hours for, for uh, our undergrads. And um, if they work more than that, uh, I get upset. Okay, so the idea is actually to teach students how to be effective with the time that they have, um, not to over crank. Right? And it's very much a core part of our motto, is, is to think about how to be intelligent uh, given constraints, but, but not to overwork, and then you know, get burnt out the next week. And so, on. Um, so here I'm showing you a picture uh, from uh, a SIG meeting. Um, so Bomani's presenting, he's one of the students on the project, and you see Jenny and Sasha and Alicia who are working on different projects. Uh, Alicia's a SIG head here, and I'm sitting over there. Um, and my dog is there, um, mostly just to hang out, but, but also for moral support and emotional support. Okay, so I want to move on and talk about help and collaboration. Um, and the core idea here is just that we distribute help across the entire community. And one of the ways we support this is by having these meetings, called studio meetings, where for three hours, all the students from the different SIGs come together, and we use this time to do anything from peer help um, to some learning modules that help students learn how to make arguments and learn about research, um, and also for status updates where students present work in progress as they're doing it. Um, one of the tools that support our studio meetings is called Pair Research, um, and it's a tool for matching students up to, to, to help each other. Okay? So let me show you Pair Research right now. Um, so I'm going in, and I go, uh, I need help finalizing the intro to my talk. Okay? So I'm putting that in, and other people are doing the same. 
And I'm reading how well I could help each person, right? So five is I could help them a lot. One is I, I can't really help them. And again, other people are doing the same. And as we put in these readings, we're essentially building up this network and this graph. And then confetti falls from the sky. <laughs> Very important. Okay, and then we have these pairings. Okay, and what these pairings are, are the globally optimal pairings that you can make across the community, connecting people who could best help each other. And the way to think about that is, I'm more likely to get paired with a student who has a request that other people can't quite deal with, but I can. Right? And this is how the system tries to make effective use of everyone's expertise across the system, while we're using this to, of course, develop and gain more expertise. Right? This is kind of our way to, to build more expertise and more capacity. Um, one other interesting tidbit about this tool is that it actually purposely doesn't make perfect pairings. Um, so we tweak it a little bit, where if you pair with someone recently, uh, we're less likely to pair you the following week. And the idea is that we want to try to spread out your skills um, more, more dispersed across the community, so you don't just keep pairing with the same person. Um, so pair research is great, and uh, you get a lot of benefits of using it on your own. And you, could, you could use it right now, it's, it's on the web. Um, but the, the point I want to make here is that distributed help is not just a single tool, um, but instead it's this helping culture that we've created that's supported by this entire ecosystem around distributed help. So for example, um, what you're seeing here on the left is uh, where students learning over the shoulder uh, from another student. Um, we also have in Slack all these different channels that students can go for different kinds of help. And on the top right, uh, it's a mentorship program, an onboarding program that my students started themselves. Um, where my undergrads thought it was really hard for a first quarter student to adjust to all the terminology and all these tools and how we do things. So they created a mentoring and onboarding program where they have these weekly meetings between a new student and an old student uh, in pairs. Um, and then from uh, SIG meetings, we also get all these benefits where we ask students to think about who are you going to get help from? What are the things that's going to most block you from getting help, right? All these things end up helping beyond just the pair research tool. And finally, on the bottom, um, what I'm showing you is just a, a one question out of many uh, on our self-assessment. So every 10 weeks, uh, my students do a 10-page self-assessment to reflect on their learning and, and what are the areas they want to grow. And one of the questions that gets asked is, what did you learn about collaboration teamwork and helping and receiving help this quarter? And so students take this very seriously and they really think about their processes. And all these things together, um, having this helping culture is, is what, what's allowing us um, to do distributed help. Um, so just to present some of the high-level outcomes, uh, in the first three years of our program, we posted 50 students who worked out 25 student-led research projects. Um, and they won 29 undergraduate research grants from the university, um, and that's the most that any faculties had, and it's the most that, so in three years, it's the most that uh, computer science has had in the last 10 years, uh, combined across all faculty. So that's a lot. Um, and then uh, the students published 11 papers and extended abstracts at ACM conferences, and AAA conferences as well. Um, and we've had four student research competition winners. So most recently, uh, Sarah Lim, um, who's done some wonderful work on, on learning web programming uh, at the Kai Student Research Competition. Um, and lastly, but, but not, not least, 96% um, of students stayed in DTR for at least two quarters. And by most, I mean almost everyone uh, continues till they graduate. Um, so we have some students who's been there for, for over three years. And um, it's just really heartwarming to, to see the students uh, continuing to come back and continue to get benefits from this learning program. Um, we also found students developing regulation skills and planning over time. So just put up some of the planning strategies that students uh, reported uh, adopting and learning over time. Things like building at the appropriate fidelity, prioritizing important features and research questions, sequencing tasks, and in some cases, moving on despite uncertainty or imperfect knowledge, because you have to do that. Um, and then just to show you some of the results on, on help and help seeking, um, students help more than a third of their studio every quarter. Um, and what I'm showing you on the right is a graph where each node is a student, each color is a SIG, and what you see is that students do a lot of help. Uh, so the, 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 the edges are, are help requests and help giving. Um, students help both within SIGs and across SIGs. Right? So we're getting this benefit of getting um, the within SIG kind of collaboration, but, but also across. Um, and then just that quote on that bottom left, um, a student said, I can ask for help and that everyone asks for help, and it doesn't make them stupid uh, to need help. And some of you might see that and be like, well, that's not a big deal. Um, I'll be the first to admit, I, I, I'm pretty terrible at help seeking. Right? I think I could do it all, but I can't. Um, and for students to be developing help seeking disposition, even if we just have early evidence of that, to me is really encouraging and something that we want to continue to foster um, within our community. Um, so coming back to this problem of faculty time, uh, it now takes me 10 to 12 hours uh, to run my studio. 
Um, so five of those hours is spent on SIG meetings, so one hour for each meeting. It's actually four hours now, because uh, my graduate student, Yang Song, now runs his own SIGs. He's kind of kicked me out of the SIG. <laughs> he's been well-trained enough over three years of me being in SIG. Now he's in his fourth year, he, he's running his own SIG. Um, there's three hours for the studio meeting, and then I spend about two hours for in-person help, and two hours to just respond to needs that, that come up. Um, and uh, in, this is my typical schedule, but you know, in the week before the kite deadline, uh, my life is as bad as any of yours. Right? Um, we still have you know, all these things we're trying to work on across all these papers. Um, I do have some ideas for that as well. I'm happy to talk about that often. Okay, so in summary, uh, we have a computational ecosystem for agile research studios that develops regulation skills for research planning and help seeking across all these ecosystem interactions. And the core idea here is that we're able to extend the scale and the capacity of this community to learn and to produce in a way that a single mentor can't but with the ecosystem, we can. Right? And to me, that's the real core idea here, that it really took all these interconnections and everyone chipping in to help um, for us to be able to do um, One of the questions I'm really interested in exploring in future work is, how do you develop these regulation skills, and, and, and you're doing it inside the university, but how does that affect students when they move out of the university? Right? So my goal for doing this, you know, the, the, the joke is that we're training research but we're really using research to teach regulation skills. And what I'm really excited about is how students can take these skills to really do what they care about and advance their values, but have the skills for doing that um, out there in the world. Right? So that's the question I'm really interested in looking at uh, in our continuing work. Um, so any questions on the Agile Research Studios piece? Yes? Have you used any of these methods in classroom teaching or in group projects for classes? Uh, yes, there's been a lot of spillover effects. Uh, so my interaction design class uses a lot of these techniques. Um, my social computing class uses, yeah, so, so yes. Um, and we're also experimenting those classes and bringing some of the things we're trying there. So for example, we help students keep track of their progress across a large set of skills mm -hmm. um, as we go through agile process and we brought that back from a single classroom back into this community. Um, something we're piloting this quarter. Yes, in the back. Um, could you, I mean, you were just saying how uh, it would be valuable for the students to apply them to like what and figure out their own values. Can yep. you clarify how you um, teach like reflection skills as opposed to regulation skills or do you see them? Yeah, so I, I didn't talk about it as much. It's a great question. Uh, we think about reflection as a core part of regulation, right? Because a lot of awareness of your own processes are, are critical to being able to to develop better regulation skills. So, so I definitely think of it as a component. Um, we do a lot to train that. I'm not going to get into all of it today. I, I did mention the self-assessment we do at the end of every quarter. We also do an exit meeting with every student at the end of every quarter following that self-assessment um, to go over it and to think about the areas of growth um, they want to go into. Um, so yeah, I'll say they're very complimentary, but happy to talk more offline. Um, I'm going to move on to, to the last part of my talk. Um, and I just want to spend a few minutes um, giving you a preview of how we're thinking about advancing the kind of system level thinking that's embedded in these ecosystem examples as we move forward. Um, so the first example, or the first preview, is about ecosystem level architectures. And the way I think about this is, how do you have these enabling technologies that could coordinate these activities across the ecosystem, right? Where these technologies are allowing us to support both individual goals for the ecosystem members, um, but also the function of the ecosystem as well. Uh, so to give you an example of this, we've been working in this domain called on-the-go crowdsourcing, where the idea is to use people's existing mobility as they're going from place to place, and their existing routines to help other people in the community and tasks they might come up with. So in this example, uh, this young woman is picking up a package for herself, and then she gets a ping from this app. Would you also be willing to pick up packages for your dorm mates? And she says yes, to, to, to three of them, apparently, right? And then she's taking this back to her dorm. And the idea here is that, on one hand, I'm exploring an alternative model for tasking, um, kind of like an alternative model for the peer economies model that you might see in Uber and whatnot. Um, but I'm actually really interested also in social capital and socio-technical capital through these systems to, to rebuild uh, local communities in a way where by having these convenient contributions that are easy to do for individuals and then meet and fit within their routines, we could also advance the goals of the community where we're building these connections across the community. Um, I'm not going to get the, into this in too much detail, um, but one of the challenges that you'll see in doing this is of course, if you care about individual convenience and you want the person just to do their own routine, but you also want to be effective for the system as a whole, there's got to be some tension there. Right? And what we've been doing is developing um, these techniques or architectures that allow you to bridge across the two. Um, so for example, what I'm showing you here is a system called Hitterweight, 
And what it does is it never asks people to go out of their way, but on your route, it thinks about what are the places where you could best help that you might reach, that had you reached there, um, then the behavior that you will do or the help that you give there, for example, looking for a lost item in this example, um, is where we need the most help. Right? So it's this idea that you just let people do whatever they want, but if the system can somehow still produce globally effective behaviors uh, on the back end for, to, to make this happen. Okay. So just to show you this really quickly of this happening, it's making these hit or wait decisions um, as it's going through this region. Right? And it's just thinking about, well, Dwight, can you, or maybe you'll go somewhere that's even better. Right? There's a task that better fits your needs or, or that better fits uh, what well, the system needs that you're better equipped to, to help with. Then this, the, the system might actually wait. Right? So we're using decision theory in the back end here, not just to get you know, more optimal behaviors, but really to enable these kinds of life form interactions that allows community members to be helping, um, but in a way that's convenient to them, but also in a way that's globally effective uh, for the system. It's something I'm really interested in exploring more uh, as we keep working on this. Uh, the second preview uh, is this idea of doing mixed initiative interactions, but doing this at the ecosystem level. Um, so thinking about how to use multiple interconnected human and machine components um, to realize the outcomes that we care about. So thinking about integration, but also decomposition um, across human and machine parts um, as we do this. Okay, so just real quickly, um, I'm going to present this example of readily available learning experiences where you can take any example on the web right now of any website and you can say, well, I want to learn how Tumblr's homepage works when I scroll. Do you guys see that? It's super smooth. Right? Like Tumblr has like one of the nicest scrolling animations. Um, they also have 100,000 lines of code on their front page. Right? It's really hard to actually go in there, um, A, to pull out the relevant code, but even more so to help learners build a conceptual model of how it works so that they could go implement it themselves. Um, so on that conceptual model question, um, we developed a tool from the student Josh Hishman called Isoplat. Um, and what this tool does, I'm showing you the New York City Skyline article from National Geographic, is that you could go in there, you could explore these features and play with it. And on the back end, what it's doing is building this, this call graph of all the function calls. And it gives you these aspect filters on top that gives you a, all these views into the program where you can look at all the Ajax calls and the stuff that went through the mouse, but not related to keyboard events. Right? And you could go in there and create custom filters to look for code, for example, the mouse events after a certain point in time. Right? And you're getting all these different views that gives you this way of navigating and doing sense making. So instead of just giving you the code up front, what's happening here is someone might look at a, uh, so the purple lines, by the way, um, are the asynchronous bindings, right? which are JavaScript. It's always like, where the heck did that get called from? Where was the binding? So you get those as well. Right? But when you go in and do the sense making process, you might start at a piece. You label it, you understand it, and then you, from there, try to understand what's happening across that whole area. Right? So it's this idea that the tools are not just a machine that gives you some stuff, but there's this mixed initiative process of you constructing your own understanding and the tools supporting it as you go along. Um, and while this is a wonderful start, um, what we're really excited about is this idea of thinking about mixed initiative scaffolds that run across the ecosystem. So to give you a quick sense of this, what we do is that we take the conceptual models that learners are building, and we use the labels that learners generated to help the computer come up with scaffolded exercises to give the learner to practice implementing these concepts. And then we take the practice that the students do to then help with whatever computer guidance we have for applying these concepts. And we essentially create a closed loop by using mixed initiative across all these different tools and what the learner is doing in their learning to help the computer do something it couldn't do without what the learner did, right? to get this kind of uh, close loop for, for, for learning. It's just really exciting to think about mixed initiative more broadly um, across all these human and machine parts. Um, so I see that I'm just about out of time. Um, I just want to end on this thought about uh, the role that technology can play in advancing human values at scale. And I just want to start by saying uh, there's been a lot that's said about human values right? in HCI. You could read stuff by Batya Friedman, uh, really nice work. Um, and people don't all share the same values, right? So my goal here is just making a point about scaling with technology. I'm not going to be arguing for any specific value um, as a singular thing. Um, and the point I want to make here is that I think there's a real opportunity for computing to advance the richness of human life and the values we care about. Um, but it'd be really naive to think that better tech uh, means that we're going to scale solutions that advance our values. Right? So here I have a quote from Nicholas Carr in the book The Shallows. He writes, the net's interactivity gives us powerful new tools for finding information, expressing ourselves, and conversing with others. It also turns us into lab rats, constantly pressing levers to get tiny pellets, 
of social or intellectual nourishment. Right? So you might look at this and say, well, he's just being really dramatic, it's not that big a deal, but um, whichever side you lay on that uh, argument or that debate, there is a certain fixation with scaling in computer science um, that can sometimes overlook how scaling with technology can compromise the values that you have. And um, there's this short story called The Machine Stops uh, from 1909 that I encourage you all to read by Ian Foster, um, where he talks about how the scaling and helping the machine progress essentially loses parts of ourselves um, over, over time. Okay? And this is cool, very early uh, in the story where the boy is talking to his mother and trying to get the mother to visit him. But, but she says, no, no, I could see you on this plate, right? This screen, essentially. Right? So in the story, there's already social media, the internet, and, and virtual reality. Okay, this is 1909. Okay, so uh, in here, uh, the boy says to the mother, the machine is much, but it's not everything. I see something like you in this plate, but I do not see you. I hear something like you through this telephone, but I do not hear you. This is why I want you to come, pay me a visit, so we can meet face to face and talk about the hopes that are in my mind. Okay. So I find this quote kind of heartwarming uh, that you know, someone's reaching out for connection, but also really heartbreaking, right? That as we're scaling and having all this wonderful technology, um, what are we losing in that process? And, and, and have we lost something core um, about what we want for ourselves? Um, so the question I want to leave you with is this. Um, think of a value you want to scale. Okay? And then think about the solutions that technology provides for scaling that value. If they're fully aligned, I have nothing to say to you. You're, you're doing great. Okay? But if they're not, what do you do? Um, and one of the things that I'm really worried about is that we adopt what I call technological values, where we say, well, no, no, actually my values is, is just what technology could do. Those are my values, right? But if we do that, we will all lose something by you not expressing what you want through your work, right? And really what I hope we do is that we stick with the values we want to scale, and then we go through this process of learning how to scale that, right? So I would love to offer the kind of research training I can offer to, to many more students, but I only know how to do it with 20 right now. But that's great. That's the problem I'm focused on, because the values I care about are training these self-directed learners, and I'm not going to compromise on those values. Um, so to end, um, I would welcome you all to be mindful of your values, um, to reach beyond the limits of what technology can do on its own, and really to learn to scale, right? I really emphasize the word learn there, because scaling is not just more computers, right, or more machine power. Um, it's really this deliberate practice of learning how to be humble about ourselves as we try to face this really complex human challenge that we're dealing with. Um, and to do this, I think computational ecosystems is a part of this discussion because if it's going to be about humans, um, then thinking ecologically about how we fit within all these humans and machines is going to be important. And we're also going to need computational thinking um, to bring our intelligence to bear in solving these problems. Okay? So um, with that, I would um, just want to end by saying that um, I would love for us to embrace all that technology has offered us. Um, but at the same time, um, be, be, be embracing our own values as well. Okay. So thank you all, and uh, I'll, I'll end there.